we live in a digital era, a digital age, so it just makes sense that people meet online. But we're building something way bigger than that dating app. We're building a social layer to Bitcoin. Hello and welcome to Bitcoin with Jake. This is a podcast all about people's personal journeys to Bitcoin. I wanted to know more about the people converging on this new form of money. Why do they see value in it? What skills enable their understanding? How is it changing their lives? If you're a founder looking for funding or an investor looking to make investments, then please reach out as I develop my network in the space. Do me a favor and chuck us a five-star rating on whichever app you're using to listen or a like if you're watching it somewhere. As insignificant as this may seem, they help a startup project like this hugely. Lastly, if you have any questions at all, please just reach out. The easiest place to find me is on Twitter at Jake E. S. Woodhouse. Now, I'd like to take a quick moment to talk about our sponsor. Fast Bitcoins are a Bitcoin exchange who you should definitely take a look at next time you're thinking of making a Bitcoin purchase. They're a great team, which for me is always the key to due diligence, whilst their product has a ton of features useful to every Bitcoiner. Check out my episodes with Danny Brewster, the founder CEO, and Nathan Smith, the chief compliance officer, to learn more about the people behind the brand. Thank you to Fast Bitcoins for sponsoring the show. Now, on to today's episode. Today, I'm speaking with Matteo Pellegrini of the Orange Pill app. Hey, Matteo, how are you? Hey, Jake. I'm good. I'm good. You? I'm very, very well. Thank you. And I'm taking your virginity as your, your first podcast you mentioned just offline now. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with me today. And yes, as your, as your business launches, I'm sure you'll do many, many more of these in the, uh, in the months and years to come. So I'm excited to hear your story. I always start in the same way. So this is a Bitcoin podcast, but generally we will talk a lot more around your personal journey and what brought you to Bitcoin. So just to kick things off, when did you first come across Bitcoin? Was there a friend that you know nudged you in a bar at some point and said, buy this stuff? Or how did you first learn about it? That is a, that is a painful question, my friend. Because <laughs> I first thought about Bitcoin in 2012. Yep. The price was $5. <laughs> Guess what I said? You said that's dumb. Oh, it's just, I say it's a scam. So, yeah, a friend of mine who's a, you know, was a big uh, nerd, like tech. And I was living in London and uh, my friend was living in Switzerland. And he said, oh, man, you should look into Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. And I say, man, and I say, it's a scam. It's a scam. I literally spent zero seconds looking into this. Although it was 2012, so I don't know how much could have, uh, I don't know how much I could have learned because I don't think there's many books or podcasts as, as they are today. But anyway, so five dollars says a scam. The year after, it was maybe 120, and somebody said, "Oh, you should buy Bitcoin." I say, "It's too late now. Don't buy." So I was literally telling people not to buy Bitcoin when it was 120, and then for. The next, I guess, then the price crashed and nobody told me about Bitcoin for the next three or four years. But the way I really got into Bitcoin is because I joined Twitter in 2016, maybe 2015. And there was this guy that was in, it was into all the conspiracy theory. You, you name it and it was in a conspiracy theory. And it, but he was like, you should buy Bitcoin, you buy Bitcoin every day was conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory, and buy Bitcoin. I'm like, oh my God, man, please. But I did buy Bitcoin because of this guy, and I bought maybe $20, right? I said, let me just get some, just in case, right? So I bought some, bought a Coinbase, got some Bitcoin, and completely forgot about it. And then it was maybe 2016, pretty sure it was 2016, summer of 2016, or maybe 2017, uh, Naval, which I knew from outside of Bitcoin because I, I had some tech companies. So I knew Naval, right? And I knew he was a billionaire. And I knew he was a super smart guy. And then one night he posted this long thread about Bitcoin. And my brain goes, wait a minute. Why is this guy that I know is a credible guy mm. talking about Bitcoin if Bitcoin is a scam? So then that was my moment, like, okay, I need to look into this. That night, I was like, okay, tomorrow morning, first thing, I need to find out what the hell is going on. And that's when I go back to Coinbase, open my account. Of course, I forgot the password. 
get the new <laughs> password, open the app, and I'm like, and I bought twenty dollars. I remember I bought twenty. I think I bought ten dollars of Bitcoin and ten dollars of Ethereum back when the conspiracy theory guy told me, and it was one hundred and fifty dollars. And I'm like, it's definitely a scam. Like, <laughs> what goes up this much in one year? Because you know, I, I have been, you know, I have a degree in economics. And I've been investing in like, you know, the traditional uh, fiat world before that. And it's like nothing goes up 20x in a year. Nothing. I never see anything that, like that in my life. But because of Naval, I say, I still have to find this out because mm -hmm. I know, I know Naval. And, you know, I'm not going to second judge Naval. And that's pretty much how I really go into, how I entered the rabbit hole. So that was maybe 2017. I think what happened after is that 2017, I bought, I don't know, maybe one, I don't even remember how much, but price goes up 20,000, super excited. And then it crashed 2018. It crashed completely. And I'm like, oh, I know what I should do now. I should buy shit coins. That's when, and I remember I would go to a library. I was living in, by then I was living in Los Angeles. And I would go to this library every morning and my strategy was very simple. And this is at the beginning of the bear market, right? My strategy was, okay, I'm going to buy every shit coin that is in the top 100 that goes down 10% yesterday. So if a shit coin in the top 100 went down 10%, I would buy some. So you can imagine, because it was the beginning, the beginning of the bear market, how many shit coins I bought. <laughs> I bought all the shit coins for months and months and months. Like, and they keep, and the next day they will keep going down and more. And I was like, so at some point I just stopped this strategy, thank God. And so that was, uh, you know, spring of 2018. So in spring 2018, I'm like, okay, I, I'm done, right? I got burned. I bought all the shit coins on Binance. I don't even know how many shit coins I had, probably 50. And then, and then I was like, but I still had the bug in my head about Bitcoin. And I started listening to podcasts. I think maybe safer than I bought the Bitcoin standard and I was reading the Bitcoin standard in the summer of 2018 after all the shit coin debacle. And by December of 2018, which was Christmas, I would tell people to buy Bitcoin. I was like, here's my gift. P.S. by Bitcoin. I still remember that. And Bitcoin, I think it was maybe 3,000 or 4,000. So, so, so yeah, 2019, from 2019 on, it was like, okay, I'm only in Bitcoin. And then, and then obviously Michael Saylor was the big, uh, for me, Michael Saylor was like the big reveal. And I'm like, okay, if this guy is putting half a billion dollars of his own money into Bitcoin, I should also put all money into Bitcoin. So, I went back and checked my purchases of Bitcoin. And you can see, and I, you know, I checked because I was curious. The day that the, the seller announced that he was you know, um, converting his cash balance into Bitcoin is when, you, is when you see my purchases just ramping up. So by September of 2020, I was all in in Bitcoin, literally. Every penny I had, sold the house, bought Bitcoin, I don't know, 9,000, 10,000, something like that. So from 2020, September, I'm like, you can call me a math So that's the journey. Awesome. And there's so many things there that I can resonate with. What I'd like to do before I, I, I really draw on all of those is um, dig around a little more and understand the context for all of this. So I think a lot of us that are into Bitcoin now have had similar journeys in terms of, you know, the price goes up, you catch your attention or someone tells you about it and you say scam and it, it's, everyone's different, but kind of the, the similarities in there. You mentioned that you are a, an economics student. So teach me a bit about that. So when you did an economics degree, where were you? Why were you interested in economics? And what did you take away from that? And of course, today you're, you're building a, a digital product that's focused entirely on Bitcoin. And as you've explained, you know, from an investing perspective, you were pretty much all in on Bitcoin a couple of years you know, behind us as of today in 2020. So what kind of what context were you, you looking at Bitcoin from? And you mentioned you were into, into investing as well. So teach me a bit about like, you know, what brought you to that stage, if that makes sense. Sure. So 
I guess the reason why I study economics is because I and my family always told me that I was always into like making money. Like the, the earliest story they told me that when I was five, I would go to my grandmother's garden and I would pick up strawberries. And then I would go to my grandmother and sell her strawberries to her. This was my first business. And so... <laughs> Bingo. So that, yeah. And so I was always been so I was being fascinated with like making money and, and why people make some decision around money and that kind of stuff. So I, you know, I had a very boring high school. I was studying uh, electronics, which I didn't like at all. But uh, during high school, one of the classes, one of the, yeah, I guess you can call classes, was economics. And during economic classes, I was the top of the class. I probably was the top of the school. I literally remember the professor would just interview me for the duration of the class. And I would just talk about economics because I loved so much. And I would read the book way before even the, the homework, right? I would just read the book because I enjoyed that. And so I was being fascinated by economics and money. And most important, I think, the psychology. Because at the end of the day, economics is psychology, right? Why people do certain action with their money and their time and their resources so so the, so high school i i passed with the lowest possible grade you can think of and i enrolled into economics at the university of florence but that's where i'm from i'm from florence italy and i love it i love economics i was studying like i never studied before in my life i literally studied more than what i should because i, I loved it so you know i got pretty good grades in economics. And then I started my first company at 19, like a real company. I was selling clothing online on eBay. And it was very successful, you know, it's very successful uh, business. I started with my friends and then I finished my studies in economics. I got a degree. And obviously, I don't have to tell you this, nobody ever told me about money. You study economics. Of course, no Austrian economics mentioned even once, at least that I remember. I'm sure I would remember if I did. It's all about Keynesian economics and, yeah. you know, the yeah. government is in charge and money supply, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's how I entered the world as an adult. As like, you know, it's not even in the back of my mind that money should be separated from government. Because nobody yeah. ever told me once. Yeah. I never encountered Austrian economics. This is back in 20, 2005. I was, you know, obviously I wasn't on Twitter. Twitter didn't exist. Social media really didn't exist, yeah. especially in Italy. So I was really insulated by all of that. But as soon as I turned 18, I opened a bank account and I opened an investing account that I could buy and sell stocks. That is, that's before I even studied economics. That, that, that's also my passion. Of course, I lost all the money. That's, you know, that's uh, typical. But I remember I would, this is before the internet. So I would go as an 18 year old boy to the bank and tell the manager of the bank, I want to buy this stock and this stock and this stock. And I was reading books just because I wanted to invest. And so that was my, my formation in economics. But, you know, my skills or talent, if you will, it's always been in business. I've always been better at building business than investing. Of course, until Bitcoin, that's a different story. So, yeah, that's, that's my background pretty much. No, fantastic. And I've been lucky to visit Florence before. It's such a beautiful place. I love going to Italy, having grown up in the UK and, and going on holiday to parts of Europe. Like Florence would be right up there. It's one of my favorite spots. It's quite fun imagining you uh, growing up there and uh, trading stocks and selling clothes on eBay. Like epic. What a what a, a start to life. So that first business, what happened in the end? So you, you were able to work well, full time or you ended up closing it down or what happened with that? Good question. So I, at some point, I was 21, I think. So I had another passion in life on top of business. My passion was being a DJ. Awesome. Like probably many kids. So um, I wanted to be a DJ. In fact, the guy that I started the business with was a DJ that taught me how to DJ. Mm -hmm. And then while he was teaching me how to be a DJ, we ended up starting this company on the sideline, which then became quite a big company. And then I, and then I went to London. I went to London one weekend, girlfriend that I had back then, and I fall in love with London. Mm, I spent awesome. two days, oh my God, I love London. 
I think so that different to Florence. Second time. So different. Oh yeah, so different. Yeah, massive. The nightlife was amazing, and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and that was my second time I left Italy. Like by then, and so I said to myself, as soon as I get my degree, I'm gonna move to London. And so, when I got my degree in 2006. I said immediately my brain said, okay, now next next move is not okay, now you have a degree, you also have a business, you should probably scale the business. I was, you know, quite young and naive. I said, okay, let's so I sold the company, I sold my shares of the company to my business partner. Okay. And with that money, I moved to London. Awesome. So so that's what happened to the company. <laughs> yeah, and I I've spent many years living in London, obviously growing up in the UK. It's a, it's an awesome place to spend time when you're young there's just so much partying you can do all over the town so yeah yeah what yes. fun so so yes. you went you went to london how old were you when you moved there and you went to be so a full-time 20... dj or you went studying or sure i mean I, I was 22 and i had some cash from the company and i just went there so sounds man, dreamy let's, <laughs> let's find out and i ended up living in Maidaville, which i'm uh -huh. sure you know where it is and it was very like picturesque Maidaville, London houses, you know, beautiful, like townhouses close by the park. I can't remember the name now. And I would go there and watch cricket. And then I ended up meeting, as you probably know, there's a lot of Italians in London, mm -hmm. especially before Brexit, because you could just move to London. You don't have no paper. You just fly in, get a rent and move to London. So I ended up having tons and tons of Italian friends. So I would speak more Italian in London than almost in Florence. And then, yeah, I would go every night and I, and I eventually ended up finding a gig as a DJ in uh, Angel. Can't remember the name, but yeah, I did a DJ for maybe a year. And then I found out I don't really like being a DJ. So I stopped that and I bought a piano. I bought a piano and I said, okay, now my new, my new mission is to become a pianist. At 23. Wow. So I guess, I guess I really wanted to be a musician for a long time. So I, I you know, I got a piano, moved to Greenwich, you know, Millennium Village, very, very nice, very, you know, uh, very beautiful place to be. And I would go to North London to take a piano lesson from this Polish teacher for years, probably two years I've done it. Let's say music was not in my, not, music was not in my future. It was not in my destiny. <laughs> and so, and so, funny enough, two years, yeah, 2008, I'm still talking to my ex business partner, and I start another company, which ended up becoming quite a, probably, the, well, definitely the biggest company I had so far, which was a shipping company. Because my business partner would, was importing clothing from Asia to Italy. And then we found out that if you send clothing from Asia to London and then from London to Italy, you don't pay custom fees. Now, don't ask me why, because I don't remember. But we figured out, oh man, I'm going to send you all the shipping to your house in Greenwich and then you send it to me in Italy and then we don't pay any custom fees. I said, okay, sure. I'll make some money. Why not? It's just, I just have to change the label and Called the courier and the courier pick it up. I don't have to do anything else, right? But during but during this this uh, exercise, I found out that in the UK there was this company called Parcel Line. And Parcel Line was not a courier, but they would resell the courier services. So they would have a contract with like DHL and TNT and UPS and the Royal Mail, and then they would sell it online to privates. And I would use that service to send the package to my friend in Italy. Mm -hmm. And so one day I'm like, huh, this is such a great business. Because basically all they do is a website and they reroute the orders from the, uh, from the retail to the, to the couriers. And I'm like, why don't I do this in Italy? Because in Italy, there was no such thing. But of course, there were courier service like UPS mm -hmm. and yep. know, DHL, that kind of stuff. And so I... And so I started a company called Spedira.com, which I still exist in, which was literally, I went to the courier and say, okay, I'm going to be your client. Give me the best price you can. And then I'm going to build the website. 
and I'm going to sell the shipping to the people that will not afford a membership with the courier. So say you have to send, let's say, a package of one pound. If you go to UPS, they'll charge you $20. But if you have a contract with UPS, because you're a company, you ship thousands of, thousands of packages a day, they'll charge you $7. Mm-hmm. But that was, that was my business, right? So Interesting. I would pay UPS $7. And then I create a website where you can put your address, where the package is, and then you put the package where it has to be, it has to go. And then I would charge the customer, the retail customer, $15 and pay UPS $7. Mm-hmm. And UPS will do all the service. We'll pick up the package, Perfect. deliver it. That's it. And so, so that became a very, very, very successful business. The funny thing, the business was in Italy, but I was still in London. And... I run this business from London, and then I had a number, a VoIP number that I had a 055, which is a Florence zip code. So people would call this number thinking they're calling somebody in Florence, but I was actually in London. Wow. Picking yeah. up the phone to the, to the internet. And so that business was so successful that one day, three years after, you know, I started this company, my, my main supplier, which is a, my year from Europe, you probably know TNT. They have an orange. Yep, yep. You know TNT? I think they've been acquired by UPS. Anyway, TNT was like my main uh, supplier. I actually at some point became the biggest client in all of Italy of TNT. Wow. So think about Gucci, Ferragamo. Think about all the big companies in Italy. Wow. They sell. Because I, was, because I didn't have a product myself, I would just gather... All yep. the users, all the yep. people, yep. all around Italy, and then they all go through my account. Yeah, it's very smart. So, so TNT was like, oh man, like, so at some point, you know, so at the beginning I had an account with the TNT in Florence, and then as I grow, they keep moving me up the food chain. Eventually, I was managed by the account of Italy, yeah, sorry, TNT National, Italian in the Italian headquarters, right? So big account, a lot of money going through, you know, blah, blah. And then one day they called me and said, ah, you know, you need to come to the, our office. We have to talk to you. Sure. I'm living in London. So I take a plane, <laughs> go to Florence. I love it. Drive to the airport there. And, and they told me, we can't work with you anymore. I said, what do you mean? No, because uh, the, uh, you know, the big boss, whatever, they have decided they're going to be your competitor. Wow. So overnight, my supplier became my competitor. Wow. And, and I was like, hmm, I wonder how this is going to work. Because I had so much business going to them. And I obviously, the invoice that would send me, I would pay 60 days, 90 days. I owe them a lot of money. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so, so I said, okay, sure, you know, great. If you want to, if you want to go and become a competitor, you know, good luck getting paid the invoice that I owe you because you're not supply anymore. You become a competitor. So, so long story short, I sold the business to another company, which means, you know, not, I don't want to, I don't want to get technical, but the company, the, the debt that I owe, the company didn't exist anymore. The business was acquired by another company. So the other company didn't have any debt. So long story short, I didn't pay them a dime. I didn't pay them a dime because, of course, you know, why would I pay them a dime? And so that was one of the exits. So one of the exits was keep the money from TNT. Wow. Keep the list. And thanks for, <laughs> thanks for the donation. Um, so the company, obviously, you know, I got paid for that. And I didn't pay the invoices because they pretty much stabbed me in the back. And then with that cash, that was at that point was 2012, 2013. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. 2012, yeah. 2013. With that cash, I moved back to Italy. I moved back to Milan and I started Uber before Uber. So I had a, I had a taxi app called Cabello. And because in London, there was this company called Halo. You probably remember that. Yeah. yeah. Halo taxi app. I said, mm, that's a great idea. Let's go to Italy and let's do, and you know, same, same idea of big copy business from the UK to Italy, right? Moved to Milan. Build this up, 
at this point, I had quite a lot of cash on hands, but I never, I never developed an app before because all I had with the previous company was a website, mm. quite sophisticated, but it was a website. There was no app store or Google Play. And the developers that I used to build the website, which was very, very talented, he did not do apps. So I had to find developers from scratch. And I thought, okay, you know, what's the point? I found one developer to build the website. The first developer that I found was the great developer. So in my head, I'm like, how hard is it going to be to find developers for an app? Mm. Little did I know that it was super hard. Mm. And so, so I built this app where you can book taxi in Milan without going through the agencies. And the app didn't work. The app didn't work. I launched the app. <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, why, why wouldn't worry? You know, they're developers, right? They know what they're doing. And I had um, gathered a lot of uh, media attention around this app because I was the first in all of Italy. Uber didn't exist yet mm. in Italy. In fact, I didn't even know about Uber. It was just starting in the United States. I only knew about Halo in London, mm. very successful company. I didn't even know about Uber. And so I launched this app. I have all the media interviewing me the day before. Like, you name it. Like, the biggest newspaper in Italy, they were calling me. Oh, tell me about this app, blah, blah, I launched this app. I have taxi drivers in Milan. Everybody would know me. When I, when I take a taxi, they say, oh, I know you. You're the guy from Cabell. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I will pitch the business because, obviously, the deal was that with the app, you don't have to pay the fee to the unions. Yes, yeah. You make more money, right? You cut the middleman. So the unions didn't like me at all, obviously. And it's funny because they would do announcement over the radio not to use the app, which, which obviously achieved the op opposite result. Yeah. The taxi driver said, wow, why should I use this app? Because I make more money. Anyway, long story short, launch the app, thinking in my head, here we go, another home run, great. And the app didn't work. The app didn't work because I never built an app before. And I, you know, I didn't know that I didn't even know that developers could be that bad. Wow. And so, and then also Uber just came to Milan, I think maybe two months later with billions of dollars. And so, you know, obviously that didn't work. So I moved to New York uh, in 2014. Yeah. Moved to New York. April 1st, 2014. That was my first day in, in the United States. And I ended up living in close to Central Park. And just to give you an idea how bad the winter is in New York, on the 2nd of April, 2014, uh, when I wake up, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm literally one block from Central Park. I need, I should go for a run, right? Classic New York life. <laughs> and I go to New York and I go to Central Park. This is the 2nd of April. There is no on the side of the path. Yeah. On the second of hmm, Interesting. So anyway, so I moved to New York and, you know, love New York. And, and in New York, I had another app. By then, I have found great developers. Mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the past years that I'm building apps, I've been the taxi app, fired the original guys, find other guys, found great developers, super great developers. Funny enough, from Florence. So I work with developers from Canada and the United Kingdom, Slovenia, India, Bangladesh, you name it. And the best developers that I found were literally from my hometown. Wow. And, and with them, we launched another app, which was called Nyam Nyam app. Not a great name, but the idea of this app is indoor food delivery. So I was at the stadium watching the Fiorentina game. And I'm, I'm looking at the guy going around the stadium with the popcorn and the, and the drinks, right? And he's shouting, who wants popcorn? Popcorn and soda, popcorn and soda. I'm like, this is so inefficient. I'm looking at, and I, and I had my phone in my hand because I was looking at Instagram. So I'm looking at the phone, I'm looking at the guy, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure everybody at the stadium has an iPhone. This is 2013, right? Most people had a smartphone by then. Why? There is not an app where you can order your popcorn or your drinks and put the seat number. And then the guy, instead of screaming and hoping to find somebody that wants the popcorn, can just go around the stadium and just deliver the food that is already being paid through the app. 
So I built that up. I built that up. I almost ended up having a partnership with Fiorentina, which is my hometown soccer team. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. First division. But I didn't much realize, I don't remember why, Italians, they're not exactly tech, tech lovers. So I moved to New York and I ended up working with the biggest uh, theater company in Broadway, Schubert. Uh, it's called Schubert Company. And they used the app so that people during the shows, they would make orders before intermission. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever been to a theater, you know, intermission is like, yeah, packed. It's like a stampede. It's a stampede, right? Because everybody, you have 20 minutes to get all the food and all the drinks, right? And so I convinced uh, Schubert Company to use the app so that people could make orders before the show. Because obviously during the show, you don't want to use the app. So you, because you have your ticket, you know where you're sitting. Uh, actually, no, there was no delivery. So you pick it up at the bar, right? So you, you say, this show is blah, blah, blah. Intermission at this hour. This is what I want to buy. When I go to the bar, I don't have to do a line. I just go and pick it up. I show the QR code. I show the order. So that was that was pretty successful. Uh, not as great as I thought because people didn't really not want to use the phone at the theater. And we had also, we had funny enough, believe it or not, we had Wi-Fi problems because there were too many people in the same space, right? And so I sold the technology to Schubert, to the theater agency in 2015. 2016, 2015. Um, so the technology said, okay, you guys, here's the technology, do whatever you want, you know, and move to Los Angeles in 2016. Moved to Los Angeles and uh, from 2016 until 2022, I did not do any tech business. I took my break from, yeah, I think I was still doing some business, but I took my break from like, building tech companies and e-commerce and that kind of stuff and that's you know that's uh that's where how we end up with orange wow and it's it's so amazing to me to hear all of that because the point is as entrepreneurs you don't know what the future holds but you have this idea and it's like okay how do i take this idea and make it into reality and the truth is is that creating reality is hard and you make mistakes along the way and so what i see from all of this is someone who's built and sold businesses before in a number of different places and has seen an opportunity in the bitcoin space now that you've got familiar with bitcoin you own a lot of bitcoin you have some serious skin in the game from that perspective but it's like how can i then reapply what i've learned before to this space as well so what I'd love to learn about more now is more specifically the Orange Pill app. So <clears throat> what was the genesis of the idea for the Orange Pill app? And, you know, much like you're sitting sure. watching your beloved Fiorentina and you're like, that's a really, really stupid process. You're in the Bitcoin right. space and you've gone, I don't like the way that meetups are run, perhaps. I have, I have no idea what the genesis story is, but teach us a bit about, you know, what was the problem that you came across and how does the Orange Pill app solve that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, as you can imagine, as you can imagine, given my background, I, since 2020, I always thought, man, how come I don't have a Bitcoin company, right? Because I built companies mm -hmm. and I couldn't really find an angle that was like, oh, okay, this, this could be a good idea. You know, the exchanges, they're already there. So, you know, for, for, so since September 2020, or let's say August 2020, when I really went all in, until April 2022, which is when I got this idea, and I'll tell you how, I was really like, man, I got to find something to do with Bitcoin on top of just buying Bitcoin and, you know. Uh, and I totally agree with you on this, by the way. Like, once <laughs> you get properly down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, you're like, how do I support it in some way? Build a business. What's right. everyone else already doing? Where can I fit in? What are exactly. my skills? Fucking banging. Go on. Tell me. Tell me April 2022. So, you stole yeah. something. So April 22, which is literally seven months ago, I guess, uh, it feels longer. I was driving down Santa Monica. So I lived in Santa Monica in Los Angeles, right? And I'm driving down and I'm, you know, I'm fully, fully all in, spending all my time on Twitter, listening to all the podcasts, you name it. I probably listened to all the Michael Saw podcasts probably twice, right? Yeah. I love He's Michael Saw podcasts. He's brilliant, that guy. brilliant. And I... Yeah, and I was sent podcasts of Michael Sewell to literally everybody, right? He's my <laughs> chief orange peeler, right? Just yep. 
And I always say, look, it's kind of like the Bitcoin CEO, right? If you don't know anything, just listen to him. Yeah. Nobody explains what it is. So anyway, so I'm driving down Santa Monica and I'm listening to a podcast, obviously. And I'm looking at all these, you know, people and houses. And I'm like, damn, there's got to be more Bitcoiners in Santa Monica than the one that I know. And because the one that I know is the one that I created, meaning all my friends in Santa Monica, they were in Bitcoin. They were in Bitcoin because of me. Yeah. Because if you spend any amount of time with me, you're going to end up being a Bitcoin. <laughs> so, and I'm like, so basically, I don't know any Bitcoiners that is not, that is independent of me. I, I don't know any external Bitcoin. And I'm like, and in Santa Monica, there's probably like, 400,000 people, right? I say, you know, number one, there's got to be Bitcoiners around here that I don't know, clearly. And I don't know if, I don't even know if there was a meetup. Probably there was, but I've never been a big fan of a meetup. And I'm like, how am I going to find Bitcoiners near me? Because I know there must be, you know, it's LA, it's Santa Monica, you know, it's now, you know, with all due respect, it's now middle of nowhere, Indiana. And so I thought, oh, dating apps, right? Dating apps is how you find people near you for dating, but you know, they've solved that problem. The problem of finding people near you has been solved very successfully by dating apps. Geolocation, create a profile, make a geolocation. And so I thought, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You know, you just need to find, you just need to make an app. Let's say, I'm going to make an app that uses geolocation. So then, if my neighbor is also in Bitcoin, I don't have to go and knock on his door and ask if he's in Bitcoin, which is something that I was going to do because I was so desperate to find more Bitcoins, right? I said, <laughs> man, I'm going to go and knock on people's house or whatever at the coffee place. Hey, are you in Bitcoin? You know, which if you're not in Bitcoin, that's really, it's not really appealing. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I got the idea. I say, okay, I'm going to make an app that people can sign up and with geolocation, then, you know, they can just see how cool, they can just see people nearby. They're also in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so that was the journey. It's uh, six months, six, seven months ago now. Yeah. Awesome. I love That's it. That's how it all started. And, and, and I agree with you. Like this <clears throat> Bitcoin Twitter is good. Meetups, I haven't had as much success with in a sense. And so it, it's, it's very nice meeting people that are into Bitcoin in person. It really, it, it really is cool because there's a lot of people that think you're completely right. fucking mental. And, you immediately have these aligned values. And if you do have a significant portion of your wealth in Bitcoin, you have an immediate like rapport, right? You you have skin in the fucking game. And that's that's much more than you have with a lot of other people, right? So, so something that intrigues me, certainly from a, a business building perspective, is you know, Tinder or whatever, they could just create a, a drop down which is like, do they want to be into Bitcoin? Yes or no. So the the existing dating apps could morph quite quickly into having subsections of of interests um so that's like more of a competition question but then equally i'm looking at market size and you know how many bitcoins are there today you know anyone with more than five grand in bitcoin or 50 percent of their net wealth in bitcoin is a bitcoin or is a random definition and let's say there might be like what 100 million of them maybe so like that's a pretty healthy market size to go after but what interests me and one of the reasons i'm starting a podcast is it's actually not about preaching to the choir and saying, here's another Bitcoin podcast for the people that are already listening to Bitcoin podcasts. It's like there's 99% of the global population that don't yet listen to Bitcoin podcasts. And at some stage, they're going to want to learn, like, why are other people adopting it? Who's interested in it? What backgrounds do they have? And that's really, to me, that's what's exciting about starting a Bitcoin podcast. So I don't know about, like, your Orange Pill app and how you've looked at, you know, your user profiles, but I'd love to just learn a bit more about some of those points I touched on. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, so first of all, it's not a dating app. Dot com. And and sorry, Thank yes, you. I should I should actually ask one more question before you answer mine, which is shout out to Daniel yeah. Prince for asking. But That's you know, audience Prince. question from Princey: Is it a dating app? It is not a dating app, ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen. It, it it can be, it can be, as the say goes, if you're single, every app is a dating app. Even even Google Maps is a dating app, right? You're gonna look at reviews and somebody's old, you're gonna respond to the review, right? But yeah, it's not a dating app for two obvious reasons. One, it would be a very skewed dating app because there's not a lot of women in Bitcoin, probably number one. 
In fact, I can tell you from the beta users, because you know now we're in beta and we're launching next week. I think right now we have almost 200 users in the beta and maybe we have five women, one of which is my wife, which shouldn't be in this app to begin with, but <laughs> that's beside the point. So it's very, 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 very male dominated. Yeah, uh, so the, the pool uh, of talent for the lads space. to chase on the Orange Pill app is yes. going to automatically make it more difficult for them to find a partner than not. Yeah, okay. Unless you like men. Unless you're a man. True, like men, true, true, fine. of course. But, and secondly, yeah, the dating apps are, are cool, you know, nothing wrong with that. And, you know, they built many relationships. Great. We live in a digital era, a digital age, so it just makes sense that people meet online. But we're building something way bigger than a dating app. We're building a social layer to Bitcoin. Mm. So Bitcoin has many layers. There's the mind layer, there's technology layer, there's the idea layer. There's the political layer. There's, you know, Bitcoin is many, many things as as, as we know. <clears throat> but I I I feel that the social layer is missing. Although you know there are some alternative, which is meetups and conferences, which are mm -hmm. great. But if you've been to a meetup or if you've gone to a conference, you know very well that I know exactly the best way to meet Bitcoiners. Because so if you go to a meetup, first of all, somebody has have to set up the meetup. So you don't have, you can't choose. Oh, I want to meet somebody on Sunday morning at nine. If there's no meet up on Sunday morning at nine, you're not going to yes, meet up. It's not flexible in that sense. So first, yeah. Interesting. It's not spontaneous. It's not yes. spontaneous. Yes, good word. Number two, you have to drive and park, and then you go there, and then maybe there's a fifty. So now I live close to San Francisco. I move out from LA, and I go to the uh, SF Dev Meetup, which is super cool, high, 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 high tech level you know fly past my head but it's cool 50 people how many people do i talk to when i go there three or four five six yeah. huh? so i drive one hour i go to san francisco i i hope the homeless don't smash my car which unfortunately happened but whatever wow. and then i go to this meetup and then i am competing with everybody else for attention because everybody else is in bitcoin so I can't say, hey, bro, are you in Bitcoin? Me too. Let's go get a beer because everybody's in Bitcoin. So what is your angle? So it's not, it's not very efficient to go mm -hmm. to a Misa. I mean, it's great, obviously. Don't get me wrong. It's great. Now, conferences, it's even worse because they're way more expensive than a, than a meetup. You know, I'm going to... So Orange Pill Up is a sponsor at Pacific Bitcoin, mm -hmm. which is next week. And it's going to be our future launch. The ticket is seven hundred dollars, plus hotel, plus flight. Yeah, it's a big investment. Plus. So now, let's say you spend a thousand dollars, right? Maybe if not more, they spend a thousand dollars. Even if you meet ten people, that's a hundred dollar per meeting. That's that is not exactly affordable, mm. and it's also not scalable because the moment the conference shut down, once the conference is gone, once the circus has left town. What happened next? You know, maybe you met somebody at the conference that lives in San Francisco or New York or whatever. You're in LA. So, you know, so Orange Peel is a solution to all of that. Mm. Orange Peel is an app that's in your pocket 24 7, anywhere you go on planet Earth works. So, we're going to be live in 175 countries. So, anywhere there's an app store, you'll be able to download the app. And it's one ninety nine a month, the membership. Now, why do we have a membership? And that's, that probably answered the question about Tinder. So, you know, once I got the idea of the app, I'm like, mm, okay, great. How do I make sure that you're in Bitcoin? Right? How do I know that Jake is really into Bitcoin? I can't. I, you know, I really can't say, hey, show me your Bitcoin wallet. Send me your bank statement. Let me see how much fiat you have. Can't do that. So at some point, they had an idea that I should do a little test. I should ask a question about Bitcoin. And there's like six questions in 60 seconds. And if you answer at least four, you go through, you're accepted. Mm. Of course, if you're a woman, you can get them all wrong. You still got to go through because you want to have more women. And so eventually I found out, but because I still need to make money out of this business because, you know, building an app is very expensive and promoting yeah, yeah. is expensive. Yeah, what I was going to ask next. Stuff. So I still have to make money out of this. And also, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm full-time on this. 
And so the, the solution came to me of, which is funny because now Twitter is doing the same, which is the logical thing to do, charge users to use the platform. Do not sell their data, do not track them, do not add advertising because nobody likes advertising, right? So Orange Pill app, it's a membership base. So one way you can see this app is a private club for Bitcoiners. Mm. And so unlike Tinder, where you can just click, oh yes, I mean Bitcoin, sure. Mm. Great. Maybe you bought $10, maybe you're a cow in a Bitcoin. Maybe you're just a gold digger that wants to get a Bitcoin because you think you don't know there's a bear market. Mm. Because people outside of Bitcoin think everybody in Bitcoin is rich. So we put a check at the door. To get into Orange Pill app, you have to pay. So if you pay, first of all, I don't have to track, I don't have to sell your data, I don't have to do anything, any monetization behind your back. Number two, we disincentivize scammers and bots, NFT, all the shit connery, right? Because why would you why would you pay, put your credit card information? And and then do scam like well, and then also use geolocation, right? So, mm. so it's a way to disinst- to remove the noise or to at least reduce the noise, and it's the most ethical business model you can think of. Value for value, you like the product, great, pay for it. And so, and so Tinder is not Tinder charges way more than one and ten a month. Also, you can pay. You can have a you know they, we also have a sponsorship membership. So the app. Is going to be free in El Salvador because we want to encourage El Salvador and we want to develop El Salvador as much as we can. So if you're in if you're in El Salvador in the Orange Pill app, the app is completely free. And so there is a membership, uh, there's a sponsorship membership on Orange Pill app that you can pay four ninety nine or nine ninety nine a month. Also, it helps the company reach more plebs, mm. so it's more likely that you're going to find another pleb near you. And then. In a couple of months, we're also going to have SATS membership, you know, where you just pay the membership in Satoshi, which ideally that's all we could do. But, you know, Apple and Google, they don't let you do that. No, long story. And so that's how we verify kind of like proof of work when you think about it. Mm. Well, that, and that's the, the phrase that was really springing to mind that, you know, once you, once you study Bitcoin, you know, I start to see proof of work everywhere. Like, and, and we right. value things. And it's so obvious why I value something is because of proof of work. It's like, oh, and you start to see it. It's, right. it's, it's, it's integrated in our lives all around us. And it's um, right. And it's funny when there is, sorry to interrupt you, Jake. No, no, go, it's go. It's funny because it's funny because, you know, now there is a big divide, proof of work, proof of stake because of Ethereum. And it's funny because once you really understand proof of work and how fundamental it is, you see very well when there is no proof of work, AKA something is free, then you become the product. Yes. And you become the stake of somebody else. Mm. Yep. You become the yield. So Facebook is free. Mm. So when you go on Facebook, you don't have to pay for nothing. Mm -hmm. So there is no proof of work. You make an account, done. Then you are the stake in the proof of stake system called Facebook, in mm. which Zuckerberg is obviously, you know, the king of the proof of stake. The more time you spend on Facebook, the more the stake grows in value. So the proof of stake, proof of work dichotomy, it's it's once you, you know, once you spend some time thinking about it, it's very apparent. So one of my assumptions is that in a Bitcoin world, there would be no such thing as free services and that kind of stuff. It's like, you like something, you pay. You don't like something, fine, don't pay for it. Mm. It's like very, very like transparent, value for value. The proof of stake, which is a symptom of fiat system, obviously, you know, fiat and proof of stake is the same thing. And the, the idea that services should be free is a mindset, is a fiat mindset, right? Because mm. why are the services free? Mm. Because Money is cheap, and so I could raise ten million dollars, and I can give you the service for free, and I can sell your data, and I can sell to somebody else proof of stake. Mm. So your stake goes from me to somebody else. But the proof of stake is, you know, I don't want to sound too catastrophic, but it's very akin to slavery. Mm. Uh, in a way, as as a 
as an ideology. You know, in slavery, you sell the slave from one owner to another. In proof of stake, you sell one stake from one owner to another. Mm -hmm. So when you're free, you are the product. And so you, your data, which is you online, can be sold from Facebook to Google to Nike to Apple. You know, to that's the proof of stake yeah. system. Yeah. So we obviously don't want to do that. We, you know, that's... That's why we're Bitcoin and Mars. That's yeah. why we're Bitcoins. And so proof of work, you know, pay to use the app because also, also there's another advantage is that, you know, if there were two clubs, right? If it's a hey Jake, there is two, two clubs. One club is free. One club you have to pay to get in. Which one is going to have the more interesting or the highest value members? The one that is free or the one that you have to pay for to get in? Well, I'm assuming the one that people pay to get into. Well, no, exactly, right? Because because hmm. the fact that you pay is because also you get involved into the club, you get involved into you, it. You want to be you there. Invested. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you want the club to be successful, so you got to stuff to grow the club, right? And so that's, you know, that's the idea behind the membership. And now, obviously, as we all know, Twitter is, is going down the same path, which, you know, which... Um, it's so interesting to obviously. watch how that plays out as well, isn't it? Um, right. Well, Matteo, so, so an hour has almost flown by. We've got time for probably another question or so. But what intrigues me as uh, someone that's been in the startup space before, made some angel investments, is this idea that, you know, first of all, Bitcoin allows you to free up your time. And so you can stick all of your value, your capital, your cash, whatever you want to call it, into Bitcoin. And if you hold it for four years, you can be pretty certain that it's going to be substantially more purchasing power than today. Whoa. Okay, huge pressure off your shoulders when it comes to how you generate a salary or generate cash flow or how you invest because you've worked out a way of storing value over time. Brilliant. I'm also equally interested, therefore, in you know projects like yourself. It's like, okay, you are a, a creative guy who's got a track record of building businesses and you're bringing all that experience to the table to build a Bitcoin-focused business. Interesting. Now, you may not be taking investment. I have no idea how that's working. But what would intrigue me as a user of your app is to, to connect with like-minded people who are into Bitcoin, but also interested in starting companies. And you know, because there's different types of Bitcoiners, right? Some people are in it because they just want to sit at home and mine Bitcoin off their, you know, swimming pool heat or whatever the fuck they want to do, or they want to eat meat or they want to fast right. or they want to do a number of different things with, with people they meet through Bitcoin. Um, and my particular skew is like, okay, well, who can I meet that? is actually building companies. And that, that company building process will augment the value of Bitcoin over time. I wouldn't ever suggest to have all your money in the company building versus Bitcoin. I think you go, you know, 80% of your value can sit in Bitcoin and the rest is effectively a venture fund that you can spray around in a few different things, perhaps. I'm not sure. So I, I don't know if you have any comments to that, but it, it just, it strikes me that there's a, a genuine phenomenon with Bitcoin that there's this decentralized network that's attracted people from all different skills and lines of work in different geographic locations and you've gone and you've seen the ecosystem and so i'm not going to build an exchange i'm not going to build you know a hardware wallet oh i've got an idea and, and we'll see that happen more and more won't we so yeah i don't know if you have any comments to that kind of thought process i've been through but it's it's very exciting yeah absolutely so i mean i think it's just natural that once you really understand bitcoin or you know it's hard to say you really understand bitcoin because probably nobody does Maybe not even Satoshi, if he's still alive. It's only natural that you want to dedicate your life, your energy to this thing that is so, it's so like uh, mind blowing, you know, it's mind blowing. The first mm. time we have, we have merged the physical world and the digital world mm. through proof of work. That's the first time that ever happened. That's for me, it's the real breakthrough. It's you have link energy in the real world and you transport into the into the digital world, like into the cyberspace. And now, because of that, you can do money, and you can do communication, you can do a lot of stuff. In, I mean, in terms of building companies, obviously, I wouldn't recommend it unless unless you really you really you know you really have a passion for it and you have some capital to you know to go through. And it's hard. I mean, if it was easy, everybody would do it, huh? It's not easy, but if you have an idea and you think the world would be better with that idea being reality than not, then you should go for it and, you know, find people along the journey that they also believe in that idea. 
And, you know, that's, that's what you could do on Orange Pillar. On Orange Pillar, you're going to be able to find, if you want to be the Bitcoin company, you're going to find people in your area or, you know, I give you, a, I give you an example because this is funny. Without naming names, I have met through Orange Pillar, me, myself, as a user of Orange Pillar, I have met a big name in the Bitcoin ecosystem that, that is coming on as an advisor to Orange Pillar and to Orange Pillar, to the cool. base app, with, with 150 users. Of course, it's not local to me. I think there's nobody local to me because I live in the middle of nowhere now. But the fact that he was in the beta, of course, the beta you don't have to pay, but you still have to download the beta. You still have to do some proof of work. It was an immediate like, oh, you know, in the base, in Orange Pill Up, you're going to find people that are like, unlike Twitter, where you can just make an account and say you're in Bitcoin and maybe you're not in Bitcoin because you just want to show you, you just want to scam people. On Orange Pill Up, we do some verification in terms of like, you have to pay, you have to allow your location, that kind of stuff, you have to download an app. And so, yeah, so Orange Pill Up is going gonna, is gonna to help founders and people with ideas, whether it's a business, whether it's a art idea, whether it's a, you know, charity idea, whether it's a political, you idea. know, it could be society building type conversations, like, you know, how do you create civilization? Absolutely. So much cool um, stuff. Yeah. yeah. What is a book? Uh, it's a book club. You want to read all yeah. the Bitcoin, you know, this many of Bitcoin books by now, right? How do you find people in your town where you can go and meet once a week to mm. read the Bitcoin stuff? That's what that's 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 what we want to do. Brilliant. We want to give you a platform, a tool. So one sentence that I really like that I come out uh, while I was doing a, a session with Knut, which is one of the advisors of Orange Pillar, is this, and this is from Michael Siller: Bitcoin dematerializes money, Orange Pillar materializes Bitcoiners. Nice, nice. Oh, I love it. Well, Matteo, that's a very, very nice point for us to probably draw a close. I had a, an artist just briefly, uh, Fractal Encrypt. I haven't released his, his podcast yet. It'll be out soon, but he's the creator of the Bitcoin full node sculpture. And he, he, uh, yeah, he made a brilliant comment that really resonated with me, which is that Bitcoin actualizes Bitcoin. So when you adopt Bitcoin, you, it helps actualize your dreams and you're able to spend time on things that you want to do. And yeah, it's very similar to the, the statement you just made. It's fantastic. Well, what an exciting time we're living through. Thank you so much for spending an hour with me and, and teaching me about your journey. It's so cool that people like yourselves with a, I mean, I would say a very rich pedigree of entrepreneurship with clear success, some failure, of course, but you bring all that entrepreneurial experience to the table to actually build a company. And, you know, I wish you all the, all the success in the world. I'm sure it will happen. And my final question, Matteo, is where can people reach out to you and get in touch if they want to speak to you? So I am on Twitter 24-7. At least now I have a purpose to be on Twitter 24-7. So you can find me at uh, Orange Pillar on um, Twitter. I'm cool. the guy that runs the Twitter account. So if you, if you DM me on Twitter, that'll be me. And otherwise, you can just send me an email, orangepillar at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, Matteo, best of luck building your business. And I look forward to seeing all the progress in the months to come. Thank you very much, Rick. Okay, friends, nice work. You made it all the way to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this conversation. As I said at the start, if you have any questions, then please don't hesitate to reach out. And if you enjoyed the episode, then please rate, like, subscribe, and share. That's it for now. Enjoy the rest of your day. All the best, Jake.